The name of this piece is entitled 1980 Reasons Why I Had the Worst Yet Best Time of My Life Ever. I was the only black guy at Shermer High in the Breakfast Club you didn't see. For I was hanging with the B-Boys and B-Girls over on Beach Street. We spray painted the Berlin Wall outlining our destiny with American graffiti. Our words dipped in rainbow bright let the world know these different strokes would rule the world someday. Someday with the premise that we don't need no education would lead us to jump the wall holding us back from our true selves for so many years blocking our future. Besides laughing and joking we were walking on sunshine as the sparkle in our eyes met the gleam in our smiles falling into the glow at our feet like everything Michael Jackson touched in the Billie Jean video. We found ourselves terrified by the day after tomorrow despite moments of the day taking our reaching hands and leading us forward we were unaware didn't care about the what lie ahead we knew whatever it was wherever it was it was ours. Oh yeah, we were breaking too. Electric Boogaloo was my street alias. I was known for break dancing to get away, popping and locking my augmentation when dad was playing, but not really playing at all, a game of cat and mouse or hide and go kick my tail for some dumb kid stuff I did. My tears for fears turned into shout, shout, let it all out once he finally caught me. After all, it does get dark eventually and you have to come back in the house. When my body healed and my punishment subsided, I would walk like an Egyptian to the roller rink down the street where I danced in peanut butter skates on the weekends. Weekdays had me drawing conclusions to complex mathematical problems and scientific theorems with doodled sketches found beside scribbled notes in my Trapper Keeper notebook during third period. I would sleep through anything that came after lunch. The saliva in my drool glistened like the jewel of the Nile as I dreamed of making the winning play at my next soccer game and befriending David Lee Roth so I could be a gigolo and move to the wild, wild west chasing California girls. Oh, how I wish they all could be California girls. Or that brunette girl from Weird Science. Anyway, by the time I woke up and realized I ain't got nobody, the teacher was standing over my head saying, Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. He and Principal Barney Miller, tired of my blatant defiance of authority, let me know they were fed up with me when they gathered around me in his office and said, We've been watching you, every step you take, every breath you take, we've been watching you. At this school, we are the police, and we're not gonna take it. No, we ain't gonna take it. We're not gonna take it anymore. Mm -mm. I I'm sorry, anyway, I digress. That's why I was supposed to be in Saturday's detention. But I skipped it as in most things, not because I thought I was a real genius, but because of something somewhere over the rainbow. You see, my life is a never-ending story inside a book that has no pages, bookmarked by the happy days of my youth when it seemed like all I had was a fork stuck in my plans to one day eat from silver spoons. But the facts of life taught me early, say la vie, say la vie, that's just the way it goes. That's life sometimes for a little boy who only wanted his mother to warm these places in the heart with her presence once a week, once a month. Please God, at least on my birthday. She never showed except once on my 15th birthday when my baby sister tried to eat the plastic forks, ran, bumped her head on the table surprisingly laughing about it rather than crying. 
The following year, my 16 candles lining a cake said to be mine were snuffed by my 80s teenage reality. What I thought was a cake was only a pie. That's why on most days you could find me on a march down to Electric Avenue where I met up with this kid named Lucas who most kids considered weird because he collected locusts. That's neither here or there, but as I was saying, I would hang out with him, buy Mountain Dew, and play my favorite games like Pac-Man and Tron at the arcade, a place where I began to learn the importance of the primal attraction of boys and girls. She was my first taste of a candy girl. And I felt like a new kid on the block over this new sensation called love. She, a valley girl new to the area, was living in a material world. And I, like a virgin, stood shyly on the borderline, speaking to this radiant Madonna with only a dollar left in my pocket, of which I planned to buy a chocolate sundae at McDonald's later. <laughs> I felt like a lucky star when she smiled as I found the nerve to approach. I knew that girls just want to have fun, so I read her a joke from an exposed rapper of Bazooka Bubblegum after offering her a piece as she giggled with acceptance. She said that I couldn't call her house because her dad is a preacher, and for some reason, I was either straight scared or knew, don't mess with a missionary man. She said we could meet up at the skating rink later that night. So as time slowly crept closer to when I see her again, I thought tonight is the night and I got some new shoes. So baby, I can't wait to see how fresh you look as well. I walked into the rink to my favorite song, let the music play by Shannon, rushing to get my skate so I could hit the floor. But by the time I was done, the song changed. It was okay because my second favorite song came on. I wake it, wake it, wake it, wake it, wake it! I jam on it! My nucleus was exploding with joy as I hit the floor with a barrage of kick turns and freestyle moves, hoping I could attract some girls on looking eye. And I did. Hers. I noticed her walk in and sit down momentarily watching me before putting her skates on. She looked mixed like me with fair skin and long wavy black hair falling past her shoulders. She wore a Michael Jackson beaded shirt, a pink, white, and black swatch watch, and some stonewashed jeans with a homemade cut above the right knee. She was fine. She was smiling at me.